The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents... This is your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Has this ever happened in your home? You're sitting listening to the radio when... Yes? This is the Radio Checking Bureau. Is your radio turned on? Oh, yes, it is. What program are you listening to, please? It's, the, it's uh, This is your FBI, just starting. Do you know who sponsors that program? Oh, sure I do. It's the Equitable Life Assurance Society. I listened to the Equitable program last week and heard about the fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. My Equitable Society representative brought me a copy, so naturally I know that this is your FBI is sponsored by the Equitable Society. In about 15 minutes, I'll be back with full information about the Equitable Society's fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. Tonight's FBI file, The Prodigal Brother. The Federal Bureau of Investigation is an organization composed of men who have studied crime from every angle. They know that in this past year, there have been a million and a half major crimes committed in the United States. They know that there are more than 18 million sets of fingerprints in the criminal files. They know not only those and other figures, but also what are the best ways to fight an outbreak of crime on any front. Their knowledge on the subject is specialized and modern, and yet... Some of that knowledge is almost as old as time itself. After a recent archaeological survey of some stones brought to the surface by bombing in Italy during the war, it was decided that the writing on the tablets could be deciphered to mean, and here I quote the verbatim translation, crime must be concealed by crime. Yes, that apparently was true a couple of thousand years ago, in a civilization that died shortly after those tablets were chiseled. But while the civilization died, those words, crime must be concealed by crime, are as true today as they ever were. The clothes, the speech, the habitat of the criminal may change, but down through the ages, the basic ingredient that has characterized the professional lawbreaker has been a consuming greed that drives him on and on, so that once started, he stops at nothing. The night's file opens late at night in a quiet suburban district in a large Midwestern city. A short, heavy set man furtively approaches a home in which all the lights are out. He goes up the front steps quietly. He knocks on the door. There is no answer. After a wait, he knocks again. Feeling now that no one is home, he takes a small pass key from his pocket and lets himself in. He turns on the lights, goes to the living room. He picks up the telephone and dials. As the operator answers, we hear him say... Hello, operator. This is Elmwood 469700. I want to talk to Valley City 7923. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Okay, I'll wait. He lights a cigarette... and smokes nervously as he waits for his number. Hello, Pete. Hello, hello, it's Pete Anderson there. This is George Newberry. Yeah. Yeah, we got separated. Okay. Pete will call you. When he does, tell him he's got to call me at Elmwood 46970. Go ahead, dear. Oh, hey, I gotta hang up now. Goodbye. Oh, Larry, stop 
shopping's the only part of Christmas that I don't like. I know what you mean. Where do you want to put all these packages? In the bedroom. Did you leave the lights on, Ruth? No, I don't remember. George. Hi, sis. Who's that? My brother, George. Hi, Larry. How'd you get in here? Your door was open, so I walked right in. George, I didn't know you were in town. Oh, I just got in. Came right over here. That's nice. You don't say that like you mean it. I didn't. You in trouble again? Larry, please. Well, that's the only time we ever see him. Well, that's a nice attitude to take after I go to all this bother. What bother? To spend Christmas with my sister. He's right, Larry. You mean you want him here? For the holidays, yes. Okay. Ah, thanks, Larry. Merry Christmas. <laughs> Later that night in the local FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor approaches the desk of Agent Gene Crawford. Hello, Gene. Hi, Jim. I've been waiting for you to get back. Why? What's up? The SAC just assigned us to work together on a new case. This time, and time is an important factor for us. You know a little town called Thomasville across the state line? Yes. It's right on the lake, isn't it? That's right. Well, two men stole some jewelry there this afternoon. Uh-huh. A few hours after the robbery, they're in a saloon in Thomasville when a local policeman recognized them. They tried to arrest them. One of the men took a bottle from the bar and broke it across the policeman's head. Wow. The two men separated. One of them drove away in a car. The bartender got the license number of the car, and it's just been found abandoned here in town. Any idea who the two men were? No, the local policeman is still unconscious. However, we got partial descriptions on them from the bartender. One of them has a scar on his left cheek. Well, that's not very much to go on. What about the clothes they were wearing? Well, the one who jumped into the car and drove away was wearing a black and white check Mackinac with a torn right pocket. Mm-hmm. Well, he's the one who had the scar on his face. Any other leads? Possibly one. What's that? The pieces of the broken bottle. They were shipped by air to our laboratory in Washington. Well, we won't get any word from them until tomorrow at the very earliest. That's right. However, if these men were willing to assault a policeman in broad daylight, they must be pretty desperate. Yeah, I'll go along with you on that, Jim. So we'd better start our search right now and hope we capture them before they try to murder anyone else. <laughs> Hey, sis. Yes, George. How was Larry this morning about my being here? We didn't talk about it. We didn't talk much about anything. He was late for work. Hey, is this the only razor he's got? The, the straight edge one? Yes. <laughs> yeah, this will be quite a shave. Haven't seen these since that one pop used to have, remember? Uh huh. Hey, hey, how about that time I tried to sharpen it on the strap? What a carbon job I did, huh? Yeah, I never forget the way Pop George, would... Yeah? Come here a minute, please. Oh, I'm shaving, sis. What do you want? I was just making your bed. I found this under the mattress. This gun. Oh. What are you doing with a gun, George? I can explain, sis. You are in trouble, aren't you? Uh, no. Well, then what are you doing with a gun? I used it in my work. Your work? Uh, the last job I had was a night watchman. George, are you telling me the truth? I swear to you, I am. Well, I'll show you the permit for it afterwards. It's inside my wallet. Well, you, you better not let Larry see this. Oh, well, look, sis, if you want, I'll get rid of it. I huh? wish you would. Okay. Hey, just as soon as I finish shaving. Hello? Yes, just a moment. George? Yeah? It's for you. It's a man named Pete. just got a report back from Washington. What'd they have to say? Well, Lab took those pieces of broken glass and put the bottle back together again. That's remarkable. Yeah. Then they went ahead and got enough prints off the bottle to enable Ident to send us a complete description. Whose prints are they? They belong to a thief named George Newberry. The last three times he was arrested, he was working with a hoodlum named Pete Anderson. Oh, I see. We sent a picture of Anderson to Thomasville to see if the bartender can identify him. Well, Mr. Taylor? Here. Oh, yes, Arnold? Message here for you from the teletype room. Fine. Thanks, Arnold. That's in the local police department of Valley City. Hey, Anderson was seen there, but he eluded the police and left town. Uh, I'll get it, Jim. Special Agent Taylor speaking. Yes, sir. Yes, that's right. He has? Don't have any idea at all, huh? No, I see. 
Well, thank you very much for calling, sir. Goodbye. I was a parole officer back east who handled Newberry's case for a while, Gene. He says that Newberry has a married sister living here in town. What's her name? Well, that's the rough part. He doesn't know. He just remembers hearing Newberry talk about her. Oh, these men are dangerous, Jim, and if they do meet here, we may have a two-man crime wave on our hands. Yeah, I know that, Gene. That's why I wish the story in this afternoon's papers would bring us some results. Well, it's too late now to get anything else into the papers before tomorrow morning. Yeah. But I think we ought to get down and give them this new information we have and the pictures of Newberry and Anderson. Okay. You go to the star and I'll go to the record. Okay. Meet you back here in an hour. Uh, just a minute, Ruth. What are you doing? Looking for that Mackinac George was wearing when he came here last night. Oh, I hung it right there in the closet. Uh, where? Oh, I see. Still in the right pocket. Smells of whiskey. Larry, what are you talking about? There's a story in tonight's paper about a man the police are looking for. Well, what about him? He was last seen. He was wearing a black and white Mackinac with a torn right pocket like this one. Hit a cop over the head with a bottle of whiskey, and some of the whiskey splashed over the Mackinac. I think the man they're looking for is George. The paper also says this man has a scar on his left cheek. Oh, sure, lots of people have scars. Ruth, I'm going to call the police. No, don't. You want me to cover up for him? Well, I, I think it's only fair to let George explain. All right, get him in here. I will. George. George. Yeah, we want. Could you come in here for a minute, please? Yeah, sure. What do you want, sis? I'm the one who wanted to see you, George. About what? There's a story in tonight's paper that the police are looking for a man who was last seen wearing a black and white Mackinac with a torn right pocket. Well? It also says the Mackinac smells of whiskey and the man they're looking for has a scar on his left cheek. George, it isn't you. Oh, of course not. I don't believe you. Are you calling me a liar? I'm not calling you anything, George. I'm going to let the police see if you're the man they want. You're not calling any police. Yes, I am. Stand still. Put down that gun. Sorry, I can't go along with you. George, there aren't any bullets in that gun. Huh? I took them out this morning when I found them. Is that really true, Ruth? Yes. <laughs> oh! Larry, don't hit him again, please. I won't. Come on, get up, you cheap punk. We're going to the police. Now, give me a chance, will you, Larry? No. But I promise you that... Start I... walking toward that front door. All go right, on, all move. All right, all right. You wait here, Ruth. Now, walk in front of me. Where are you going? Uh, Pete. What's the trouble? Now, this guy's taking me to the cops. Who are you? I'm a friend of his. Now turn around, mister. Go back inside. We will return in just a moment to tonight's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Now, listen. Fathers and mothers, the next 60 seconds that tick away may mark a turning point in your children's lives, may have an enormous influence on their future happiness, their future success. All that in 60 seconds? Yes, in the next 60 seconds, you will hear about the Equitable Society's famous fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. Fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers? What in the world is that? It's a chart that every father who really loves his family should have. A chart which shows him how to figure out just what income his family would need if he should die unexpectedly. The minimum amount of money his wife and children would require to maintain a comfortable standard of living. Fred, do you know how much that would be for your family? No, Mr. Keating, can't say I do. Well, you'll have the answer in five minutes flat with this Equitable Society chart. You're guided every step of the way by easy-to-understand pictures. In no time at all, you'll know just what income your family will need to keep going and to keep together during the critical years until your youngest child finishes high school. Mr. Keating, this chart looks like just what I need. How much will it cost? Not one cent, Fred. They're free. Phone your Equitable Society representative and ask him to bring you a fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. Or send a postcard, care of this ABC station, to the Equitable Life Assurance Society. Your request will be forwarded to the nearest Equitable representative. If you truly love your children, you will not let another day tick away on the clock without sending for the fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers 
prepared for you by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Prodigal Brother. Tonight's case from the files of your FBI again illustrates a point the Federal Bureau of Investigation has tried to drive home to you listeners on previous broadcasts, a point which it will continue to try to impress upon you, because without your acceptance of this fact, you cannot begin to understand how to help fight the crime wave. You do not owe any loyalty to any criminal, nor are you under any compulsion to be fair with him because he does not accept loyalty or fair treatment with any idea of returning the same to you. If you have any notion that anyone you know, be it a relative as close as the one in tonight's case or not, is a criminal, you have only one course of action open to you. That course of action is not one which is motivated by lofty ideals of your duty as a citizen to your fellow citizens. Instead, it is motivated by self-preservation, For only by doing the one thing within your power can you assure yourself of safety. That one thing, that single step which should be taken without any delay, without your holding your own version of a fair trial, is pick up your phone and call the local police. Tonight's file continues at the local FBI field office. Oh, I'm sorry to have kept you waiting, Gene. When I got back to my desk, there were a couple of messages there for me. That's all right, Jim. I just returned them in to go myself. Oh, well, one of the messages was from police headquarters. Oh. Pete Anderson was seen by a local policeman out in the Sheridan Heights district. How long ago? Within the last half hour, Anderson pulled a gun, shot the policeman, and got away. Again, huh? Yeah. You know, we've got to assume now that this was the rendezvous point. No question about that. Well, the other message I found was from Newberry's old parole officer. Could he give you anything else on Newberry's sister? Only that her husband is an accountant. Not much help. No. Yeah, I was hoping we'd raise something on that story in the papers. Yeah. No. We've been on this case since 11 o'clock last night. That's uh, 19 hours. We don't know much more now than when we started. No. I just came in on the teletype a few minutes ago for you, oh. Mr. Taylor. Thanks, son. It's from the Philadelphia office, Gene. Hmm? They've checked Newberry's old neighborhood. Did they find anything? No, well, one of the neighbors remembered that Newberry's sister's name is Ruth. That she's married to someone whose first name is Lawrence. Well, that's a lead, Jim. Ah, come on. Let's get to work and start checking. George. Yeah? What are you doing? Uh, Tightening some ropes. I want my brother-in-law to be as uncomfortable as possible. Leave him alone a minute. I want to talk to you. Yeah, what about? Stuff we heisted. You give it to the fence? Uh huh. What did the guy say? We get six thousand for the whole thing if we wait till he has a chance to get rid of the stuff. That might be a year. If we don't want to wait. We can take two thousand now. Thank you very much. We're pretty hot yet. Could stay under. Where? Here. Didn't you say your brother-in-law's an accountant? Sure. Why? If he don't show up at his office for a couple of days, somebody's going to start wondering why. You better catch this place off quick. Well, where we go? Over to Bay City to see the fence. Okay. What about them? Your relatives? Yeah. Before we go, we'll take care of them. This is the place, Gene. You cover me. Huh? Okay, Jim. Got the search warrant, haven't you? Yeah, it's right here in my pocket. Might need it. No lights on. Well, we know this is the right place. This has to be Newberry's brother in law. Uh, I think we'd better use our search warrant. Hey, front door is unlocked. Well, come on, let's go in. Okay, Jim. Let's see where's that switch? Ah, yes. Ah, let's take a look in this room on the left. Huh? Okay. 
There was a kitchen on the other side of the hall. I doubt there'd be anybody in there in the dark. I wouldn't think so. Well, the bedrooms are probably down here in the back. Let's take a look. Not much sign that anybody's here, Jim. No, there isn't. Pretty quiet. Hey, Gene. Feeding there's somebody in here. Jim, look there. Yeah, yeah, I see him. Come on there. Hands and feet are tied. Get the gags off first, Gene. All right. All right, now take it easy, mister. All right, ma'am. Mr. Mr. Hold still, I get this knot untied. All right. There we are. Oh, thank you. All right. Back up here, mister. Thanks. Are you all right, Ruth? Yes, dear. Is your name Dylan? That's right. We're special agents of the FBI. Oh, uh, Mrs. Dillon, have you seen your brother, George? Well, He I... was here. He and a friend of his are the ones that tied us up after they argued for a while whether to kill us or not. How long ago did they leave? About a half hour ago. Would you have any idea where they went? I heard my brother-in-law say they were going to Bay City. Any specific place there? No, sir. I'm sorry, but that's all I heard. Jim, there's oh. only one road between here and Bay City. Uh, did they have any transportation? Yeah, I heard him drive away from here in my car. What kind of a car is that, Mr. Dillon? It's a 1942 Chevrolet sedan, black. Gene, let's call up and have a roadblock set up between here and Bay City. the diner. Hey, Pete, why don't we go in and get some coffee? We'll wait for the driver of that truck to come out. Hmm? Which truck? Battling with a trailer full of new cars. Well, there'll be a nice score without the driver. We need him. If we get a ride on a truck, we let the driver the front for us. Uh-huh. Yep, here he comes. What do we do? Help me handle it. Hey, Mike. You talking to me? <laughs> yeah, can you give us a lift? I'm sorry. It's against the rules. This gun says we ride with you. Then I guess you do. George. Yeah, what? It's the bunk inside the cab and back of where the driver says. Climb into it. Okay. If this guy coming, like it up there with you. Right. We want you to turn around, Mac. Head for Bay City. Set down the road. Uh, looks like a roadblock. Yeah, they're stopping every car. Driver, take it easy and listen to me. Okay. There's cops up ahead. Stop when they tell you to and talk straight to them. We'll be hiding back here, and if you say one word out of line, we'll blast you. Okay, mister. You better stop. See your identification, please. Here's my badge. Thank you. Well, I have a pictures here of a couple of men we're looking for. Will you take a look at these? All right, sir. You seen either one of them? No, sir. I haven't. Mm-hmm. May I see your license, please? Yeah. Yeah, just a minute. Here you are. Thank you. Okay. Here you are. Sorry to hold you up. You can go ahead now. Oh, uh, just a minute. Yeah? Hold it a minute, will you? I want to play a searchlight into those cars up there in your trailer. Yes, sir. Oh, Sergeant, break it with your light. For the front more. Gene? Yo. See anything? No, Jim. Okay. All right, driver. You can go ahead. G men. Mm-hmm. Where are you fellas going in Bay City? Just wait till you get to town. We'll show you. Okay. Hey, you hear that? Yeah. Pull it over. What'll I do? Pull over and stop. Okay. Badge again, driver. Yes, sir. 
Here you are. Will you step down out of the cab, please? Sure. Now, get out of the way, driver. All right, Newberry. You too, Anderson. Come on out of there with your hands up. You know you're in there. Now, come on out or we'll come in after you. I'm going, Pete. No, wait. I'm going. Come on up, Jim. Yes. All right, Joe. Stand over there. Yes, sir. Here comes the other one. No. Hey, he's making a break. No, he's not. Uh, well, good work, Jim. That's the best tackle I've seen all year. Come on, Dennis. Come on, get up. All right, Gene, throw the cuffs on both okay. of them. Okay. We'll all ride back to town together. Newberry and Pete Anderson were turned over to the state for prosecution and given the death penalty for the murder of a policeman. What made Special Agent Taylor decide to overtake the trailer truck loaded with new cars was that those cars were manufactured and assembled in Bay City. Special Agent Taylor therefore realized that there would be no reason for a truck fully loaded with new cars to be headed toward the city containing the factory. And thus, because the special agent exercised a keen power of observation, two dangerous killers were captured. This was no stroke of genius, but it was calm, deliberate logic after tireless investigation. It is true that some files are closed because a special agent gets an inspiration or a hunch, call it what you will. But it is even truer that the great majority of solutions are reached because of logic and hard work. For those two are the most deadly weapons in the arsenal of every special agent as he proceeds in the never-ending fight against crime. In just a moment... We will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. But now, listen. Yes, the seconds, the days, the years are speeding by. The sooner you send for the Equitable Society's fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers, the quicker you will be able to safeguard your family's future security and happiness against the hazard of your unexpected death. So don't delay. Phone your Equitable Society representative soon. Or send a postcard to the Equitable Society, care of this ABC station. Your request will be forwarded to the nearest representative of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The story of a special agent's search for Santa Claus. Its subject, The Christmas Season. Its title, The Return of St. Nick. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry D. Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community, and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The return of St. Nick on This is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.